The fact that something like a hypergraph rewriting system has basically no a priori structure and is still capable of universal computation means that it's not ruling out as many things from the starting gate. And so in a way, you might say it's kind of unsurprising that it's so extensible in its application. I wanted to ask you about your new center. So this is the Center for Applied Compositionality, which explores the interface between mathematics, computation, and the foundations of science. Could you tell me about that? And could you explain what you mean by compositionality? Absolutely. And, and, and so this is a very direct outgrowth of the Wolfram Physics Project. Let's step back for a minute. What, what is it that we really learn from the, from the Wolfram Physics Project? The fact that we can explain things like GR and QM and so on just using these kind of combinatorial structures. What do we really learn from that? Well, one conclusion that I kind of resoundingly stu- that I came- started coming to at the end of 2020 and-, and that's really formed over the last year and a half or so is that effectively the most fundamental theories of physics we have are really theories about processes, right? They're theories about processes and how they compose. So I think the core lesson we learn from thinking about causal graphs is that the essence of general relativity is that you can compose events in sequence and you can compose events in parallel, but there are restrictions. You can only compose events in parallel if they're space-like separated, right? You can't compose yeah. events in parallel if they're time-like or light-like separated. And similarly, what is the essence of quantum mechanics? Well, in a sense, I think what we learned from thinking about things in terms of multi-way systems is that the essence of quantum mechanics is how you compose processes in parallel, right? So when you've, got, when you've got classical physics, if you've got phase spaces of two particles described by classical equations of motion, and you want to compose them together, so you get a composite system, and you want to describe the phase space of the composite system, well, that's easy to do. You just take the Cartesian product of the phase spaces you started from. So you just pair off essentially all the possible combinations of position and momentum values of the two particles. And that encodes the fact that Composition, parallel composition in classical physics is separable. You can always trace out the state of one particle and recover the state of the other. You don't lose any information. But in quantum mechanics, you can't do that because if you compose two particles described by the Schrodinger equation together and they're entangled, well, now there isn't a well-defined state of either particle in isolation. You've just got the state of the composite system. And that's a statement that, that the tensor product operation, the operation by which you compose the Hilbert spaces, is not Cartesian. It's actually closer to what you might characterized as a Kronecker product, kind of a maximally entangled quantum tensor product. Quantum mechanics is all about, I think, this, this kind of the, the liminal space between the purely classical Cartesian tensor product and the maximally quantum Kronecker tensor product and everything that's kind of in between. And so what one realizes, and, and this is really, you know, the essence of multi-way systems, right, is that there's an algebra for processes and how they compose not just in sequence, which is what traditional computation is about, but in parallel, which is what multi-computation yeah. is about. And a huge amount of stuff, including, as I say, I think basically all of GR and all of QM can be encoded somehow in this algebra for how processes compose in sequence and in parallel. And compositionality is this idea that was really shamelessly stolen from Rudolf Carnap and the Vienna Circle and theoretical linguistics of the early 20th century. So in linguistics, compositionality is the idea that if you want to know the semantics of a sentence, right, then... You can, you can derive the semantics of a sentence if you just know the semantics of the individual pieces that make it up, the individual morphemes that carry semantic meaning, and the grammar for how those morphemes compose together. And so compositionality in the category theoretic sense is just taking that idea and applying it to essentially everything, right? Yeah. In applied category theory, there's this dogma of stuff and structure. You take any system, you decompose it into stuff, which is kind of the individual semantic pieces of which it's built up and structure kind of the rules for how those pieces thread together. And everything you could care to know about the system or the process or whatever can be reconstructed from a combination of the stuff and the structure. Yeah. So in applied category theory, there's a very concrete way of of talking about this, which is, I say very concrete, it's actually very abstract, but it's very, very precise, very well defined in terms of these things called symmetric monoidal categories. Symmetric monoidal categories are really just a language for describing how processes compose in sequence and in parallel, how, how systems compose together in sequence and in parallel. And both quantum mechanics and relativity can be formulated in terms of these symmetric monoidal categories or possibly partial symmetric monoidal categories. And what I came to realize is that multi-way systems, as studied in the Wolfram Physics Project, give you essentially a kind of very concrete computational semantics for these symmetric monoidal categories. So 
it's like you've got these these two extreme you've got the you've got the very very concrete computational world of the wolfram physics project and multi-way systems and causal graphs and so on and then you've got the very abstract world that comes from category theory that describes as essentially an algebraic structure how notions like causality or processes etc are composed together but they're really describing the same thing and so the applied compositionality center what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this, this fundamental kind of philosophical principle that, as I say, has its origins in linguistics, and, but also from applied category theory, but really, I think, was really given teeth by the Wolfram Physics Project. The idea that if you just know the individual constituent components and you know the yeah. rules for how they compose together, then you know everything there is to know about the system. We're taking that kind of idea and these two methodologies, one very abstract coming from mathematics, the other very concrete coming from the Wolfram Physics Project, and we're trying to apply it to as wide a class of things as we can. So. Yeah. Not just fundamental physics, but also things like biological ecosystems, chemical reaction networks, the structure of mathematical proofs. We're, we're even trying to address some fairly general, almost philosophical questions about the nature of causality, right? What does, what does causality really mean? There are at least 20 notions of causality that have appeared in the context of distributed systems, in physics, in, in the context of indefinite causal orders, in the context of trying to maintain concurrency. There are notions of causality that come from biology, etc., what do they really have in common? Is there some abstract, essential theory of causality that we can construct? So those are the kinds of questions that we're, that we're really trying to answer. That's uh, fascinating. It's amazing what a wide range of different disciplines these ideas can be applied to. Why do you think that is? Is it just that, I don't know, a hypergraph is basically just connections between nodes, and that's a very simple idea, and so of course you're going to see that throughout science throughout the universe? Or, or is there something more about these ideas that give them such wide application? Um, I don't know if there's something more. Uh, I, 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 would be te- I would be tempted to, con- to conjecture that it, that it is merely that when you've got... Okay, one could make the same statement about mathematics, right? That, that, that uh, you know, we, we discovered that starting with physics, but progressively it's been applied to more and more disciplines. We've discovered that formulating things in terms of mathematics, particularly in terms of partial differential equations, allows us to make a lot of progress in a bunch of different areas in physics, in chemistry, in engineering, etc. Why is that, right? You could ask the same question. And I think the reason is just that the axioms for traditional continuous mathematics, so to speak, are, they're not hugely elegant, but they're reasonably minimal. And we know that they're capable of computation universality, right? The, the axioms of something like ZFC set theory are, are capable of simulating a universal Turing machine. And therefore, if we assume that our universe is a universal Turing machine, and that things in the universe can be modeled as a universal Turing machine, then you know, it's kind of unsurprising that we can configure the axioms of mathematics to simulate our universe. Yeah. And then the only remarkable thing about it is that, in a sense, the encoding function, the function that lets us map the abstract mathematical or computational states of our model to concrete physical states of our system and lets us say, ah, yes, that feature of our model, that really corresponds to this particular particle or this particular animal or something. The fact that that encoding function is quite minimal, that is quite surprising. And I don't have a good explanation for that. But in a sense, I think that my slightly circular answer would be that's what it means for a model to be, to be good, right? A good model is precisely one where the encoding function that maps from the abstract nature of the model to the concrete nature of reality is as simple as it possibly can be. Yeah. And so what I think we have with hypergraphs, I mean, not just hypergraphs, I would characterize it as multi-way rewriting based on combinatorial structures. Yeah. of which hypergraphs just happen to be a very minimal and, and elegant example. For whatever reason, and I don't profess to understand it fully, we happen, we happen to have a model that's, very min- that's itself very minimal, but which also for which the encoding function from that model to a variety of phenomena in nature and in mathematics and in other things also seems to be very minimal. And yeah, okay, maybe if you were being very speculative, you might say, well, maybe that's because it's telling us that it's somehow very close to the true ontology that nature is using. That might be true. I, I, don't, I don't really know. Yeah, I, I think it's a consequence of a combination of the fact that it's universal, it's capable of computation universality, and because it's so minimal and so structureless, uh, you know, because something like a cellular automaton or a Turing machine, of course, is also capable of universal computation. So you might yeah. ask, well, why can't you do, why can't you make the same argument for those? But as we mentioned yeah. at the beginning, they impose a lot of a priori structure, which immediately rules them out as being good models of, of certain kinds of systems, like in relativity. The fact that something like a hypergraph rewriting system has basically no a priori structure and is still capable of universal computation means that it's not ruling out as many things from the starting gate. Yeah. And so in a way, you might say it's kind of unsurprising that it's so extensible in its application. 
Well, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I'll put out a bunch of links in the show notes, but perhaps you can just give a brief overview. How can people connect with you? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, let me say thank you so much, Mark, for, for inviting me to, well, first for making this happen, inviting me to come and speak here. It's been really fun. These questions are really great. And I, and I, I really like what it is you're trying to do with, with The Last Theory. I mean, I think it's, we, it's interesting, actually, that we, we had some, right when the project was first announced, we had a bunch of people trying to kind of popularize the ideas of it. But part of the problem was because it was just announced, we kind of didn't really know what we were doing, right? We, it was still, <laughs> you know, the project was still pretty in pretty early stages. Yep. We said a lot of things that were, in retrospect, kind of wrong. Now that it's starting to mature, we've got some more results, we've got some publications, etc. Now is really the time when I feel like we, we should be starting to popularize more. And I'm, I'm really glad that you're, yep. kind of, you're part of that effort. So, so thank you. This has been really great. Okay, in terms of how to reach me, uh, yeah, so appliedcompositionality.com, that's the website for the new center. You can find my Wolfram Physics profile on wolframphysics.org. If you go to people, I'm listed there as one of the associate directors of research. So you can find some of my specific contributions to the Wolfram Physics project there. In general, I, I'm, uh, okay, so I've been absent from Twitter for about a year, <laughs> or a little bit more than a year, but I'm about- That's very I, I'm, wise, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I, it probably was. I mean, I, I, I don't know, I felt like a, I, I think I just needed a social media break, but for various yeah. reasons, I think I'm about to rejoin, or I'm about to start using Twitter again, if nothing else, because I think there are some things that the center is doing that I should probably start. I, I feel yep. kind of obligated to start publicizing. So, so possibly fairly soon reaching out to me on Twitter won't be a complete black hole like it has been for the, year, for the last year or so. But also my email address is publicly available uh, on, uh, on these various websites. As Mark will probably attest, I can be a little bit slow at responding to emails sometimes, but <laughs> I have a policy. I will, I will respond eventually. I know very few people who are good at responding to emails, but I, I, I'm probably worse than most. But if you, if you write to me, I will reply. It just may not be immediate. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I really appreciate this. Thanks for joining me on The Last Theory. Thanks so much. This is so much fun. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast, or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.